Welcome to the Skeptic Zone, the podcast from Australia for science and reason. Hello and welcome to the Skeptic Zone, episode number 404. 404. 404. I remember that number in the early days of the internet. If you remember that number too, it might uh, date you a little bit. Episode number 404 for the 17th of July 2016. Richard Saunders here with you from Sydney, Australia. Coming up on this week's show, we speak to Dr. Danny Chambers, a vet a vet in the UK who has written a very strong petition at change.org, and of course that link will be on the show notes, uh, regarding other vets using homeopathy to treat animals. And uh, during our chat with Danny, you'll understand very clearly why he's taking this strong stand, and we applaud him for that, of course. And during this segment, you'll hear a clip from a BBC news program with another vet in the UK making an outrageous claim about homeopathy and what it can cure. And if he was making the same claim for humans, well, in Australia at least, that would be illegal. Outrageous claims by a homeopath. Who would have thunk it? Anyway, coming up at the top of the show, we speak to Dr. Danny Chambers. I'm sure you'll find this a very interesting interview, and afterwards I would encourage you to go to change.org and uh, help Danny out by adding to his petition. Following that, we have a uh, an update to a story we brought you uh, a few months ago about the ABC television network here in Australia, their science show called Catalyst, and uh, their broadcasting of a story or a show called Why Fried, which was scaremongering, more or less, about mobile phone radiation. Hear the update. What has the... Uh, what has the review initiated by the ABC found? Following that, it's the Cass Files. The Cass Files with our new reporter, Dr. Cassandra Perryman. This week, Dr. Cassandra is going to check the homework, so to speak, of Australia's best psychics. As published in their magazine, International Psychics Directory, why an Australian magazine about psychics is called the International Psychics Directory, I don't know. I'm not psychic. Anyway, Dr. Cassandra will be um, checking their uh, predictions for the year 2015. 2015. So we can actually check to see how the, they went. Were they accurate? Did they predict wonderful things that really happened? Were their predictions true? Coming up on the Cass Files. Then to round off the show, it's back to Sydney Skeptics in the pub, where we have a bit of fun bending spoons, which we always do. Sydney Skeptics in the pub is always a good time. And, uh, ooh, the last uh, one we did just last week had, had my good friend Ian Bryce talking about gravitational waves. A fascinating evening. A fascinating evening. Find out more about Sydney Skeptics in the pub by following the links in the show notes from this week's episode or just google sydney skeptics in the pub and speaking of uh, skeptics australian skeptics the uh, next sydney dinner meeting of australian skeptics will be on the 6th of august not far off now and the topic is how to make skeptics even more attractive as if that was possible are there gender differences in perceptions of attraction what are we looking for in a potential mate? Can you find somebody attractive online? And what other features make us more or less attractive? Even sceptics. Now, this will be a talk by Dr. Martin Graff, Reader of Psychology at the University of New South Wales. Sounds like a very interesting dinner indeed. And you can find out more about that at sceptics.com.au. Well, speaking of dinner, I think it's time for me to run downstairs, have some mm, spaghetti, spaghetti with some nice uh, sauce and a bit of jalapenos mixed in. Yeah, that's a good combination. That's a good combination. While I enjoy that, I hope you enjoy The Skeptic Zone. Joining 
me now all the way from Edinburgh in Scotland. I don't know if there's an Edinburgh somewhere else, but this one's in Scotland. Dr. Danny Chambers. Hello, Danny. Hello. Very nice to catch up with you. And you've been making the news lately in the UK and, dare I say, around the world with your strong stance and your open letter, which we'll get to a bit later, about uh, homeopathy and veterinary practice. And this is an area we don't touch on very much at all. It's usually we're talking about homeopathy for humans. But when you look at it, humans are just another animal. What uh, what prompted you to take such a strong stand and write this open letter about uh, homeopathy and veterinaries? Well, it's actually a combination of events that all accumulated in this in me writing this petition. Um, for about three years, I've been writing to the Veterinary Times, which is obviously the, the sort of professional's journal about um, uh, about homeopathy and asking why homeopaths are allowed to maintain the registration as veterinary surgeons when it's so unscientific. Um, then this year in particular, I saw a few cases, or last year, so I should say last year, I saw a few cases that could have been treated with you know, fairly common diseases, for instance, um, hypothyroidism in the cat and Cushing's disease in horses, which is really common, where there are licensed, proven products that work really well and you would expect those animals to go on and live for several years with no signs of the disease. And people had ended up giving homeopathy instead of these treatments. And so the animals had gone downhill. Um, one or two of them had to be euthanized, and the others were just took a lot longer to, to get right. And what, what upset me was that these weren't people who weren't willing to pay for treatment. They thought they're doing their best for their animal, and they, for whatever reason, thought homeopathy was the best way to treat it. And it turned out some of these people had been getting the advice from vets, um, not just on their own, off their own back. Um, and then the third thing that made me decide to sort of start the petition when I did was the, the one in the UK that was trying to make the, um, you know, Simon Singh and the Good Thinking Societies um, a campaign to, to get the NHS to blacklist homeopathy. So... Um, that's it was that combination of events that made me decide to do something with the veterinary side of things. Right, of course, and it's our good friend Michael Marshall from the Good Thinking Society who uh, put me on to this whole story in the first place and, and hooked me up with you, and I'm very grateful for Marsh for for doing that. And you're right, it's a petition, of course. I'm, I'm saying it's an open letter, which I guess it is, but it really is a petition. It's at uh, change.org, I think it is. Uh, nevertheless, yeah. I, I'll link directly to that petition, folks, in the show notes if you want to check that out and read it for yourself and, and sign. I've certainly signed that petition. And as I say, we'll get to that uh, petition or the open letter shortly. But I was very interested, Danny, just um, in the last day or so, I was watching your very recent appearance. In fact, within the last week, you were on the BBC. You're on the BBC television and news program and BBC yeah. radio. And putting your point of view, but of course, as always happens in these situations the the media love to put on the opposing opinion to have put their point of view too and on the same bbc program was a, a lady who um claimed her horse was helped by a homeopathy but the real the real uh standout for me was a, a man by the name of uh jeff johnson who's a vet who works in the southeast of england i believe and he is very strongly for homeopathy and folks let me just play a quick clip now from that bbc program where jeff johnson makes an extraordinary claim that's very different to being i mean for instance the, the british association of homeopathic veterinary surgeons on their website have got case reports of dogs being cured by cancer i mean jeff do, do you agree that you know, do you treat cancer and can you cure cancer of homeopathy in your practice yes i do that case on the website is one of mine uh uh, there's three cases of mine up there, and I have several cases going on at the moment. Uh, and that is one reason why people come to me. And if you can get the remedy right, and you can understand the situation, you can understand the animal well enough, homeopathy gives it the ability to be able to heal itself. And I have several cases of cancer, well, more than several, many cases of cancer. OK, I'm so sorry. Got, I'm so sorry. Yeah. And we're going to have to stop this discussion right now. I mean, I know it's obviously a, a subject that 
excite strong feelings. Well, Danny, that's an extraordinary claim. And if you extrapolate that, of course, a dog is simply a mammal. So if homeopathy can cure cancer in dogs... Why couldn't it cure cancer in in humans is where my thinking's going. Well, that's exactly right. Um, It's one reason I asked him that question as well. Specifically, do you believe you can cure cancer with homeopathy? And and he said he he could cure cancer with homeopathy. And had the program not run out of time, I was going to come back and say, well, you realize there's a heck of a lot of medical research. There's a huge charity in the UK called Cancer Research who are trying to find treatments and cures and therapies for cancer. And this vet has got it, got the answer all along, and he's treating dogs with it. And um, if that doesn't show how absurd and deluded their beliefs are, that, then that, that's a really good example of people who just don't have any ob- objective view on what they're doing. And unfortunately, this guy is a vet. He's um, obviously medically trained. He obviously passed his exams. And yet he genuinely seems to believe that he is curing cancer in dogs. It's really difficult to um, accept that there's people within your own profession offering advice to the public who rely on them. And, and, and one, reason, one of the main reasons that I, I've started this campaign, and obviously animal welfare is paramount. I mean, you know, it's bad for animal welfare if, if people aren't giving proper treatments. But for me, it's also, you know, the standing of prof- the profession, like the professional reputation, the fact there's other people with the same job title as me, a veterinary surgeon, who believe that homeopathy can cure cancer. How, why should a member of the public have to decide which vets are talking sense and which vets are not giving scientific medical advice? And it's not fair on them to have to make that distinction. Absolutely right. And I, I notice that's one of the points you're making in, in your petition, which, I, again, we'll get to before before long. And it, it's I, uh, as I was saying to you uh, just off air a little while ago, Danny, that that interview you did on the BBC, although slightly frustrating because the, the amazing claims were made towards the end and you really didn't have a, a good chance to come back uh, to that claim, I think it's amazing that uh, you ha- got him to say that on national TV, and indeed it's gone around the world, and I've just played the clip. I think it's damning, quite frankly. It's damning that he's... I think you're right, it's damning, and it does show how, um, how, how crazy and deluded these beliefs are. But in, in his sort of defense, if, 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 if I'm being kind, it does show that I think he genuinely believes what he's saying, and it would show that all homeopaths aren't sort of charlatans who are deliberately trying to rip people off and trying to just simply make money, you know, by, by peddling what we'd call nonsense. I mean, I think it, it does show it's almost a bigger problem when you've got people who believe it to that extent because it, he has a belief system and no amount of evidence is going to change that. And, and he's he's got conviction and he believes he's doing his best for animals and for society. And that's actually harder to tackle than someone who's just ripping people off and they know they are. You make an, an excellent point, And it's one that comes up again and again in the skeptical realms. And I absolutely would have to agree with you that I would say that he, like most people I meet of this, of a similar nature, are very sincere and very uh, wanting uh, the great need to help people or help animals in this situation and very sincere in their beliefs and what they're doing is correct and it's right and it works, partly because, and the woman on the show too who had the problem with the horse is a great example. The wonderful feedback they get from people who say, oh, this amazing homeopathy fixed up my horse or my dog or my cat or whatever it is. And it's no wonder that people like... Um, Jeff Johnson then start to really believe what they're prescribing actually works. Yes. And what I would say in that case of the horse is, um, as as anyone who's watched that clip, if that is the best example of homeopathic medicine that they could get to bring on the BBC on national television was a horse that had no specific diagnosis and no specific problem with it is now apparently better. And that was the best example they found to... To, to, for evidence of homeopathy being useful, I thought that was pretty 
damning in itself, to be honest. Yeah. And, and one of the questions that was put to you is one that comes up again and again and again, where you're stating that uh, there's no good evidence for this uh, to work, it can't work, uh, according to the laws of physics, etc. And then the host turned to you and said, well, if everything else fails, then why, why shouldn't people turn to this? Uh, and, and you must hear this a lot. Yeah, it's probably the most common... Um, the, the most common defense of homeopathy is that when, when conventional medicine has, can go no further, what harm does it do? Um, and my argument against that would be, well, if, if you've got to the point when, uh, you know, obviously I'm a vet, so I deal with animals mainly, and euthanasia is an option, and if you've got to the point where something cannot be treated and it's going to suffer and it's going to deteriorate, or it is suffering... Um, euthanasia can be the kindest option to yeah. end suffering. Yeah. And if someone who is understandably desperate to try anything, they don't want to lose their pet, um, they, they will spend money on homeopathy. And in that case, the animal is suffering longer than it has to, and the owner has been given false hope, and they're spending money when it's you know, being charged by a professional person for something that won't change the outcome. And I really think that's that, that that's unprofessional, and it's offering the owners a disservice. And at that point, the vet's job is to really, you know, counsel the owner and make sure that they fully understand that they are making the right decision, and that euthanasia is the kindest thing to do. And you know, some things can't be treated, rather than giving a few more weeks or months of of bad quality, painful life that the owner thinks is going to maybe turn things around. I absolutely agree with you. I think that that's a very good point you make indeed. Well, Danny, wonderful to chat with you. Congratulations on taking such a strong stand. And well done on the media, by the way. I know it can be tough, and sometimes you walk away from um, the TV studio thinking, oh, if only I had said this or only I had said that. But I, I, think, you did, I think you did pretty well, and folks. There's, there's sort of two main things. There's one that says that adult humans can – you know, choose to ignore medical advice and elect to use homeopathy, even though it's been proven not to work. Whereas children and animals are completely dependent on their carers to make medical decisions for them. So in that case, I'd say it's unethical to force them to receive treatments that have been proven not to work as, as they have no choice in the matter. And for me, although, you know, I, I think homeopathy is a choice if people want to use it on themselves, one reason I have a problem with vets using it is because people put their trust in vets because they assume that their medical knowledge and training is scientifically sound and it's based on you know, the latest medical research available and they don't expect to get the vet's personal beliefs in, you know, in, in some sort of magic. And if you went to your doctor and was offered crystal healing or psychic healing and you had your trust in that doctor, you know, that would be a disservice and that would be unethical as well, I think. Um, that's probably two points points I'd make. And, and probably the final thing that I think is really important, although the media has focused very much on pets, because I guess that's most people's experience of vets, um, the media focused on pets. But, you know, I'm from a farm myself, and I know a lot of farmers try and use homeopathy in a, because the farming climate in the UK is pretty tough at the moment, and anything that would save costs, they'll try. And it's it is awful if someone's pet dies unnecessarily. But I'd say it's more significant if a family farm goes out of business because they're trying homeopathy rather than appropriate veterinary or medical treatment that was required at the time. You know, that's, a, that, that's, that's more than just the welfare of an animal. That's people's livelihoods as well, isn't it? Well, Danny, uh, all the best to you. I hope that uh, this petition really goes far. It's going far at the moment. Folks, the petition is at change.org. And I, as I said before, I'll certainly link to that in the show notes so you too can read the, um, the petition and hopefully sign it. Uh, but for now, Danny Chambers, thank you very much. Uh, great to talk with you. And uh, maybe we can catch up with you a bit down the track to see how things are going. Yeah, that'd be great. Thanks for speaking to me all the way from Australia. I didn't think to make international news. Oh, it certainly has. Danny Chambers, Dr. Danny Chambers, thank you very much. Yeah, thank you.
a call to ban veterinary surgeons from prescribing homeopathy as a treatment for animals by Danny Chambers at change.org. The following is an open letter to the Royal College of Veterinary Surgeons to ask them to blacklist homeopathy from the treatments veterinary surgeons are allowed to offer animals and their owners. We believe that the current position of allowing veterinary surgeons to prescribe homeopathic treatments, which have been proven not to work, is both an animal welfare issue and fails to meet the standard required for scientific veterinary practice. This is a disservice to the animals and their owners. An open letter to the Royal College of Veterinary Surgeons regarding veterinary homeopathy. Many systematic reviews and meta-analysis have proved conclusively that homeopathic treatments have no effect beyond the placebo effect, the Cochrane Review in 2010 being a notable one. The House of Commons Science and Technology Committee concluded that the NHS, National Health Service, should not waste public money and risk lives by funding homeopathic treatments, which have been clearly proven to have no effect beyond the placebo effect. It could be argued that as homeopathy has no effect beyond placebo, the use of it is not a cause for concern. However, we believe the use of homeopathic remedies by veterinary surgeons is potentially dangerous for several reasons. The biggest danger of homeopathy is not that the remedies are ineffective, but that some homeopaths are of the opinion that their therapies can substitute for genuine medical treatment. This is at best misleading and at worst may lead to unnecessary suffering and death. At what level of significance does homeopathy become a concern to the profession? If veterinary homeopaths wish to believe that their treatment has quickened the resolution of ringworm on a dog, then no one would begrudge them that. However, substituting effective and appropriate treatment with homeopathy for more serious diseases such as hypothyroidism in a cat could result in a potential tragedy for the owner of a much-loved companion animal. Similarly, it would be devastating for a family dairy farm that went out of business because the homeopathic treatments failed to control a mastitis problem. We believe homeopaths are acting with good intentions. We have no doubt that the majority of them are very sincere in their beliefs. But if they are not capable of assessing the evidence for themselves, then it must fall to a third party to prevent them from promoting these beliefs onto the public who rightfully put their faith in the medical knowledge that the letters MRCVS after a name implies. Members of the public put their trust in veterinary surgeons because they assume that their medical knowledge and training was gained during an accredited degree at an accredited university. They do not assume that they will be offered the veterinary surgeon's personal beliefs in therapies that have absolutely no basis in science. We are not advocating that every single treatment administered by veterinary surgeons must be proven and extensively evidence-based. Indeed, it is possible that almost half of the treatments provided by the National Health Service are of unknown efficacy. However, there is normally a logical clinical reasoning behind many of our mainstream treatments as opposed to homeopathic remedies which have been shown to have no rational basis in medicine whatsoever. We would argue that permitting veterinary surgeons to prescribe homeopathic remedies is severely contrary to the public and animal health interest. In our opinion, homeopaths should not be able to use their membership of the RCVS to promote either the validity of the treatment or the fee for it. Where do we draw the line for what members of the RCVS are allowed to offer clients? If we genuinely believe it can help, can we also offer crystal healing, Reiki or psychic healing? All recommended under our professional opinions as members of the RCVS? Can we use our standing as veterinary surgeons to charge fees for and add legitimacy to these services? So why do homeopaths with their equally unproven evidence base somehow come under exception from this? Is it appropriate for RCVS approved practice to be allowed to offer homeopathy as a service? Given the current RCVS promotion of evidence-based medicine, there seems to be a contradiction when encouraging vets to gain accredited and rigorous postgraduate qualifications, yet also permitting homeopaths to place their various homeopathic qualifications alongside their MRCVS suffix. 
Although within the veterinary profession we understand the difference between various certificates and diplomas, many members of the general public will simply be impressed by the number of letters after the name. Allowing the VETFMHOM to be alongside MRCVS bestows upon it a status it does not deserve. We firmly believe that being a MRCVS should differentiate us from the various unlicensed healers. Should they wish to, adult humans have the right to decide that they want to ignore scientific wisdom and elect for unproven or dangerous therapies. The health of animals is totally in the hands of humans charged with their care, so it would appear to be unethical to withhold mainstream medicine and inflict alternatives on creatures that have no choice in the matter. We are aware that an open letter of the same sentiment was written to the RCVS back in 2006. However, with the recent decision by the government to hold a consultation into blacklisting homeopathy on the National Health Service, would it not be wonderful for the veterinary profession to show its commitment to evidence-based medicine by leading the way in taking a definite, firm stance on this matter? To summarise... We believe the Royal College of Veterinary Surgeons should not allow members to prescribe homeopathy because 1. It is an animal welfare issue. 2. It undermines public confidence in mainstream medicine. 3. It would further differentiate veterinary surgeons from unlicensed healers. 4. It devalues conventional treatments. 5. It devalues conventional qualifications. And 6. It would allow the veterinary profession to take the lead forging the way for our human medical counterparts to do the same. The Skeptic Magazine, the journal from Australian skeptics. Subscribe online to the world's second oldest skeptical magazine. Visit www.skeptics.com.au and click the publications link. You can also find there over 30 years of back issues free to download. The Skeptic, the magazine from Australian Skeptics. Here's an update to a story we brought you way back in February of this year on episode 383 of the Skeptic Zone, a look at why fried uh, the fallout from ABC TV here in Australia, their science program Catalyst, broadcasting a story which many uh, thought was more or less scaremongering about uh, Wi-Fi radiation and mobile phone radiation. And this update comes to us from... The Sydney Morning Herald, written by Matthew Knott. ABC's Catalyst under review, reporter suspended after damaging review on Wi-Fi program. The ABC will apologise to its viewers and review its science program Catalyst after an independent investigation found a controversial episode on the potential health risks of Wi-Fi that went to air earlier this year breached its editorial standards. The damaging finding, which will see reporter Marianne de Macy suspended from on-air assignments until at least September, comes two years after a similar investigation slammed the Catalyst program for questioning the use of cholesterol-reducing medications. As with the earlier program on cholesterol, the Wi-Fi episode will be removed from the internet. As an aside, it's a good thing some of us kept a copy. Prominent scientists attacked the February program at the time as scaremongering and unscientific for questioning the links between Wi-Fi and brain tumours. Now an investigation by the ABC's Audience and Consumer Affairs Unit has found it breached the broadcaster's standards. Quote, While accepting the importance of investigating public health issues relating to safety and technology, Audience and Consumer Affairs concluded that the episode breached the ABC's editorial policy standard on accuracy and impartiality. End quote. ABC Director of Television Richard Finlayson said, 
Quote, the ABC accepts the finding and acknowledges that errors were made in the preparation and ultimate approval of the program, end quote. The review found, quote, a number of inaccuracies in the program that had favoured the unorthodox view that mobile phones and Wi-Fi causes health impacts, including brain tumours, end quote. Mr. Finlayson said the ABC would, one, make an announcement about the findings on Tuesday night's Catalyst, two, remove the episode titled Why Fried from the Catalyst website, three, publish information about the findings on the Catalyst website and ABC Corrections page. We read on. More broadly, the ABC will review the strategy and direction for the popular program. Until that review is completed in September, Dr. DeMaisi, who also fronted the cholesterol program, will not be part of any on-air assignments. Rodney Croft, a global authority on health effects of radiation and professor of public health psychology at the University of Wollongong, said at the time that the program had given weight to, quote, a fringe position that is not supported by science. I was particularly disappointed to see why Fried aired yesterday in the guise of science journalism, end quote, he said. Quote, given that radio frequency emissions are one of the most heavily researched agents that science has ever assessed, and given that, contrary to Catalyst claims, no substantial health effects have emerged, we can be very confident that the emissions are indeed safe, end quote, Professor Croft said. In 2013, ABC health specialist Norman Swan launched an extraordinary attack on Catalyst, saying two broadcasts on cholesterol and heart attacks might cause people to die if they went off their medications. In May 2014, the ABC removed both episodes from the Catalyst website after an investigation found one program had breached the broadcaster's editorial standards. And as another aside, it's interesting to note, as Skeptic Zone listeners may well remember, I've discussed a company called Patched, P-A-T-C-H apostrophe D, uh, who are marketing a little patch, a little square you stick on the back of cell phones to stop that naughty radiation. You can find them on Facebook, Patched. And I noticed that they are actually mentioning this story because their whole the whole basis of their business is to suggest that uh, Wi-Fi and cell phone radiation is dangerous to your health. And if you buy their little patch, it will stop that. So they're running the story on their Facebook page. ABC bows to, quote, vested interest, end quote. Pressure retracts the Catalyst Wi-Fi program. You might want to check them out on Facebook and, well, maybe leave a comment yourself. This is Heidi Robertson from the Northern Rivers Vaccination Supporters. We are a group of concerned citizens dedicated to promoting good science and common sense in our region, the far north coast of New South Wales. This area, famous for its natural beauty and relaxed lifestyle, also has the lowest rates of vaccination in Australia. We are out to change that by challenging the myths and misinformation and by providing good evidence-based information to the community. We'd love for you, no matter where you are in the world, to join our fight. Please visit our webpage at www.nrvs.info. We also have a link there to our Facebook page. Tweet us at nrvaxsupporters, that's V-A-X, and check us out on Wikipedia by searching for Northern Rivers Vaccination Supporters. Thank you. The Cass Files With Dr. Cassandra Perryman Today on The Cast Files, it's Psychologist versus Psychic. Hey, 
based on the hot predictions for 2015 in the psychic's directory, we can look and see how well a psychic actually hits the mark when a statistician goes back and looks at the results. First, we're going to talk about the predictions made about Australia. First, Francis Bevan stated there will be a lone wolf terrorist attack in Melbourne. It will disrupt the train lines, namely Flinders Street Station. Well, that didn't actually happen. There was a minor news story about a 17-year-old who was planning an attack in Melbourne but was caught. There was no disruption to the train lines and the attack didn't happen, so definitely a miss. That also goes with Wagan Samwell's prediction that says especially Sydney and Melbourne will experience several attempts from terrorist groups and one of our beaches will be targeted. Water, electricity supplies, and telecommunications will be impacted. Obviously, that also didn't happen. Prediction number two, the Australia dollar will continue to weaken this year. That was made by Harry T. And, well, yes, that happened, but that didn't require a psychic. Economists in about 2011 said that because of the change in the housing market, there'd be alterations to the global economy, which means the Australian dollar would also readjust and decline. No psychic needed for that. Next we get into Tony Abbott's leadership will be challenged and... He will not lead the Liberal Party to the next election. He will not be replaced by hockey. Labor will win the next election, which is unusual, as normally a party will be elected in for two terms. Well, that was Susie Cherub's prediction, and it didn't exactly match the odd turnovers that occurred, nor the highly contested election that happened in 2016 the next year. So we're going to have to call that one a miss again. The one hit I found in the Australian section of the predictions was journalist Peter Greist will be released and living in Australia by March. That did happen. He was released by Egypt and deported to Australia on the 1st of February. That said, his release was also very predictable based on how his trial in Egypt was going at the beginning of 2015. Moving on to entertainment. These ones are really fun. The first prediction by Mariah Rose was that George Clooney and his new lawyer wife will have twins, a boy and a girl. No. I see a health concern around Keith Richards from the Rolling Stones, again says Harry T, and no. Somehow Keith Richards just continues to defy the odds, and I, at this point, think he actually is well-preserved. Michael Keaton will win an Oscar for his role in Birdman. That's by Susie Cherub, and, well, the Birdman did win Best Picture, but... N no, not Michael Keaton. There will be backlash for a reality TV show after some kind of tragedy is connected to a contestant. This will prompt other participants to step forward and tell their stories. This is by Leela Williams. Well, Leela, there was a helicopter crash that killed 10 people during the shooting of a French reality TV show, but it wasn't a single contestant. Nobody came forward to tell similar stories, and the helicopter accident was just a horrible, horrible tragedy. Next, Susie Cherub, who was a miss with Birdman, also missed with her prediction that Boyhood would clean up at the Oscars. It won one Oscar for Best Supporting Actress. So, Susie, no more betting on the Oscars. Harry T. said, I see another prominent Hollywood male actor committing suicide this year, and I suppose that goes by what you consider prominent, because the only Hollywood actor I could find that had committed suicide in 2015 was Sawyer Sweeten from Everybody Loves Raymond. Did did that count? So, Harry T., I'm thinking I'm going to have to also call that a miss. So you missed on both suicide and Keith Richards. As for the environment, Harry T., again, he predicts, I see large earthquakes happening in several parts of the world, in particular California, Mexico, China, and Japan. I find that prediction as a Californian very funny because we're all along the ring of fire. But no, there were no large earthquakes, just the usual minor earthquakes. Next we have, there will be some excitement over an Australian bird or small animal that was thought to be extinct by Leela Williams. Well, that's called a Lazarus species and it happens all the time. There was not really a specific 2015 Lazarus. Elizabeth Jensen said that Ebola would continue to rage for two more months before, in the already affected areas in Africa before it settled in March and be finished by June 2015. N no, Ebola's been around since 1976 and only hit the major spotlight because it landed in the United States. 
it is still a major health concern. Elizabeth Jensen says September will see concern around a new global health epidemic. And it's a virus that's quite unusual and originates from perhaps Pakistan. Well, that, that's a definite miss. As for the royals, Francis Bevan says that Prince Harry will announce plans to marry. No. Kate and William's second baby will be a boy? Well, n- no, not at this juncture, at least. In the sports, Susie Cherub says the Panthers will win the 2015 Rugby League Grand Final, and, well, that only could have happened if they actually made it to the finals. Narelle Skurr says a seriously and possibly fatal accident Monaco Grand Prix involving the Ferrari team would happen, and that's also a no. Francis Bevan says the world will see a major breakthrough in aviation and space travel. That's a bit too vague to even be considered a hit or a miss. As is Harry T's world prediction that there will be a concern around Indonesia and its safety. That's very vague. Elizabeth Jensen has my favorite miss with this one. An increase in terrorism by the group IS, also called ISIS, in February and March 2015 will spark international outrage and quick retaliation. And then by the end of March and April, by May and early June, they will retreat and be in total disarray. Um, no, that, that didn't happen. And this goes again with uh, European and Western governments will collaborate to fight terrorists. A worldwide effort against terrorism could be called a third world war. No. No, and then we get a couple of lovely, lovely vague ones that are just statistical probabilities, really. There will be flooding in the provinces of Turkey that seriously affect agricultural industry and economy. Some homes and lives are at risk. There's provinces in Turkey that flood almost every year. And there was not a major flood that affected agriculture, but there was a major flood that affected one city. Finally, Egypt remains in repair and damage control mode for most of 2015, with no new major outbreaks of terrorism But there continues to be a small amount of damage to public buildings such as police stations in Cairo throughout the year. Well, in 2015, Egypt did have a fair bit of unrest, but it was put under control relatively quickly. And I'm going to say, Elizabeth, you were a bit too vague there. So, no, not really. So, as you can see, well, a lot of these were a blatant miss. And if not a miss, the prediction itself was either just a statistical likelihood or a vague statement. So I say for the hot predictions of 2015, this is a score for the psychologist and a miss for the psychics. Hey, this is Dr. Carl, Carl Krasinski, proud to be a skeptic, and you can find out more about me at drcarl.com and get lots of free stuff there as well. here at Skeptics in the Pub and it's great to see so many first timers come along here to Sydney Skeptics in the Pub the first Thursday of every month at the Crown Hotel. Uh, details at skeptics.com.au. Hello everybody, good evening. Hello. Hi, wow, what a turnout. We have been having a lot of fun tonight with spoons. <laughs> spoon bending lessons. Claire, did you enjoy your spoon bending lesson? I thought I'd be able to... Uh... Uh, see you out, but you tricked me again. <laughs> it was psychic power, I promise. <laughs> but now you know, right? Now I, I taught yes. you the, the, the tricks of it. <laughs> I'd be able to spy out Geller himself. But you've been, I yep. know you've been coming to Skeptics in the Pub for some time now, I think. Uh, a few years, yeah. Yeah, excellent. But uh, we have some first timers tonight, and she's shaking your head. <laughs> You're a first timer. I am, yes. What brought you along tonight? Um, I used to go to Skeptics in the Pub in Wellington, in New Zealand. Oh, right. Yeah, yeah. So I went, I went, went there quite a bit, and um, I went to the Skeptics Conference and, and things like that in New Zealand. So I uh, moved to New Ze- uh, sorry, back to Australia a while ago. So um, I saw this on Meetup and decided to pop along. Well, thanks for coming along. Tonight's talk was about gravitational waves. And it was pretty interesting, I must admit. It was, it was a bit mind-blowing. <laughs> Very, a bit technical in places, but really fascinating stuff. But we tried to have a very a big uh, selection of talks here at Skeptics in the Pub. And what brought you along here tonight? 
I saw um, the skeptics in the pub at, on the meetup and thought it'd be a really interesting group to come along to because I figured there would be great conversation, terrific discussions, and I'd learn something. And I learned how to bend spoons. <laughs> you did. <laughs> and, uh, and you probably know more about gravitational waves than you ever thought you would. Absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> and are you first timers? Yes. Yes, what brought you along tonight? Uh, we actually came to skeptic, the Skeptics' Dinner like a month ago, oh, right, right. the, the psychic, psychic Night. Yes, yes. Um, and that was quite interesting. So uh, this is this is our first pub mingle, I guess. Um, podcasts, aficionados, I guess. <laughs> so um, we wanted to meet same mind like mind like people. I'm very pleased to see you. I hope you enjoyed the evening. That's great. So I hope I see you all again. All the people gathered around these poor broken spoons. <laughs> on the table. So again, folks, that's Skeptics in the Pub here in Sydney the first Thursday of the month, but just check out uh, Meetup, Sydney Skeptics or skeptics.com.au. And thank you again, everybody. Thank you. You've argued against the same woo so many times you can do it in your sleep. Quit trying to stop the nonsense one person at a time. Join Gorilla Skepticism on Wikipedia. Help us make sure the best skeptical information is always at everyone's fingertips. We need writers, editors, translators. We need you. And take as much or as little time as you can give us. Help us make Wikipedia as accurate as it can be, and you'll literally be helping people while you sleep. To join us or find out more, send a Facebook friend request to Susan Gerbic. That's G-E-R-B-I-C. Gorilla Skepticism. The time is now. Thank you for listening to The Skeptic Zone. And I must uh, apologize at this point to all those people who subscribe to the YouTube channel Skeptic Zone Podcast. Because just lately I've put up all the back uh, episodes of the Skeptic Zone onto YouTube, and it sort of uh, well flooded a lot of uh, people's accounts. So I'm very sorry about that. I didn't see that coming. I'm not psychic. No, I should have seen it coming. A lot of people was, were surprised to see so many episodes pop up, and uh, but I'm glad to say, though, that uh, people did a, a quick thing. They just unsubscribed and resubscribed. So now. If you do subscribe to uh, the Skeptic Zone podcast via YouTube, and the links are at skepticzone.tv, every week on your YouTube feed, you'll get the new episode of the Skeptic Zone. And yeah, a lot of people uh, these days, that's how they listen to things. And it's also a great way to access all the back episodes of the Skeptic Zone, complete with time codes. So you can go to the episode in question. Look in the description in YouTube and just click on the time code number and go straight to the interview or the report you were looking for. And thank you again to those people who are signing up uh, via Patreon at uh, skepticzone.tv and your contribution, as I've said again and again, means the show keeps going. And I must say a big thank you to uh, our reporter Maynard, who uh, had me along to uh, the Totally 80s tour which he's doing at the moment. He's the MC that's touring the country. If you Google Totally 80s, uh, you'll find out the details about that uh, that big tour. I'll put it in the show notes. I was there to do some work. I was uh, Maynard's uh, camera operator for the evening, doing some behind-the-scenes work and some video production later on. But what fun it was. Oh, I had a wonderful time. Lots of big acts from the 1980s, including uh, Berlin, uh, Lamar from Kaja Gugu, Katrina from Katrina and the Waves, and all sorts of people who were all very charming. Uh, the things you get to do when you're a friend of Maynard, I tell you what. But for now, this is Richard Saunders signing off from Sydney, Australia. been listening to the Skeptic Zone podcast. 
Visit our website at www.skepticzone.tv for contacts, an archive of all episodes since 2008, and our online store. Please support The Skeptic Zone by following us on Twitter at Skeptic Zone, liking us on Facebook, and leaving a review on iTunes. You can also show your support by subscribing via PayPal for as little as 99 cents a week. The Skeptic Zone is an independent production. The views and opinions expressed on The Skeptic Zone are not necessarily those of Australian Skeptics Inc. or any other skeptical organization. Thank you.